This is the Blood Red podcast from the Liverpool Echo, giving you the inside track on all the big talking points from Anfield. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Analyzing Anfield, your tactics and analytics podcast, courtesy of the Blood Red channel. I'm Josh Williams and I'm joined by Mo Stewart. Mo, how are you getting on, mate? Not too bad, not too bad. Another week closer to the season, so uh, everything's kind of ramping up. And although that does mean that the tension is high as well as the anticipation. So every little move or half move or non-move seems to be drawing a lot of attention. It does, yeah, it's a good point. I think it's very much like we're approaching panic stations, aren't we? A bit of yeah. it's like... <laughs> As soon as you can see one goal in pre-season, everyone's like, the defence is terrible and all this stuff. So it's uh, it's interesting, to say the least. Um, and today we've got plenty of different talking points to go through. Um, different ends of the spectrum and all that stuff, really. But where should we start? We, I think we'll start with, I suppose, a relatively surprising transfer link. Um, Mo, we've got a choice here, mate. Should we play it like we've seen him play? <laughs> no, no, I, I I, owe it all to our Analyzing Anfield listeners to be as truthful as we possibly can. So, no, I haven't watched Brazilian football. I don't have a subscription to watch Copa Libertadores. But that is not to say I have not seen plenty of clips and I've analysed plenty of other people who have seen him a lot and I have some opinions. Now, what I will say is that these aren't definitive, clearly, but I still think that they're, they're strong enough opinions to see where we are in this moment. Yeah, well, I, I was going to... I debated saying that, uh, you know, I grew up watching the Brazilian Serie A, but uh, <laughs> it's not it's not true. <laughs> I've never seen him play. Um, all that is, I hadn't seen him play before this week. He was not on my radar at all. <laughs> um, completely unaware of him. So that's where we are with that. But in terms of the link and, and what's happened since it's emerged, I have obviously done my homework. Um, sent out a newsletter during the week on him. Um, and I think, to be honest, even having only watched footage of him for a week, I feel like I've got a pretty good picture in my head of exactly what he is. And I think, to, to be honest, it, it kind of captures the, the power of the data, really, and, and just how much it can inform you. Because even before watching the clip of him, just by checking his numbers, I, I got a pretty clear picture in my head of, of, of the kind of profile that he has attached to his game. Um, I don't know about you, Mo. Yeah, no, the same. There's certain things where, like you say, if you're looking at the stats first, it kind of informs you to think, okay, well, when I'm watching him, I want to see how these stats play out. So, for example, high passing percentage, but also the, the, the forward passing percentage is very high. So, He's not playing safe passes and he's still completing a lot of them. And that does bear out within the the footage. So little things like that, like you say, you can get little tips on. And the the areas of the pitch that he likes to be in and the areas of the pitch that he's not often in, that also comes through as well. Yeah, I mean, you you mentioned his his pass completion there. That's that's one of the very, very obvious um, qualities attached to his game. He just simply never loses the ball by the looks of it. Um, so far this season, he's attempted 1,063 passes in the Brazilian top flight and he's completed 992 of them. So that's a pass completion of about 93.3%. Um, for perspective, last season, I think the only two players for Liverpool who posted higher was Virgil van Dijk, who's obviously a centre-half playing the most basic passes ever. And Curtis Jones, who we we did touch on as having that real quality attached to his game. So, yeah. in terms of looking after the ball, he definitely does a lot of that. Um, I looked at like his his recent games, for example, just to paint a bit more of a picture. And um, he played against Santos over the weekend and completed eighty five of his ninety passes. Five days earlier, he faced Coritiba and play and completed ninety two of a hundred passes. And before that, he faced Flamengo and completed 56 from 58. So straight away, you're getting a pitch there of a midfielder who's very reliable in possession, secure, um, and looks after the ball really well. Mm -hmm. 
And the thing, again, the thing I like about it, because we talk about stats all the time, but I do think it's important that you use them in conjunction with watching a player. And it's like I said, you kind of like see what the stats lead you to see. So like I say, the percentage numbers are really, the pass completion numbers are really good. And then you watch the actual passes he's playing and the, the balls he's trying to play. They aren't safe. They're between the lines of defenders. Sometimes they're, I mean, he doesn't really play as many lofted passes. He does this thing where it's like, it's almost like a drill through a player rather than over a player. But he's very, very, very satisfying to watch some of his passes as well. And it's impossible when you're thinking about it in a Liverpool context, not to think about a certain Italian-born Spanish-Brazilian that we already have. Because he does look like he has a lot of the same good qualities that we get currently, well, that Thiago has, that we aren't quite really getting in the pitch, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, w- with the ball, I I think he is closer to Arthur than he is Thiago, personally. Um, sim- simply because, although he can move the ball forward, I think he averages about six progressive passes per 90 or so, which is good, not bad but kind of middle-of-the-road-ish type thing, whereas Thiago was kind of ridiculous on that end. Thiago was the kind of player who keeps the ball relentlessly and yeah. moves it forward relentlessly as well. And I think Andre looks like a a bit more of a... Have we even mentioned his name, actually? <laughs> <laughs> Is that the first I mean, of his name? To be fair, I think most people know who we're talking about. But yeah, I'm not sure we did. (laughs) To be fair, I might as well say it now. For those who aren't aware, we're getting a link with a lad called Andre from Fluminense in uh, Brazil. (laughs) Should have said that earlier, but yeah, he he looks like a a proper pass master in terms of keeping the ball. And uh, in terms of stardust, I I see less of it personally. I don't don't think he's particularly inclined to add stardust to your game in terms of passes and that. Not, Not on... Yeah, he's not like a bad passer or anything like that and in mm. terms of like you know offering nothing or anything like that. He can add value if he wants and things like that, but he's predominantly focused on ball retention from from what I'm seeing. Yeah, I mean I have maybe I've watched a, a different uh YouTube highlight package to you, but I, I do think he has got some of those big um exp- expressive passes in his locker. Again, I think the thing to remember sometimes is <clears throat> what he can do versus what he's being asked to do. Mm. And when you are thinking about a team, particularly a team like Fluminense, who do drift between double pivot and 4-3-3 three, three, from what I've seen, then he's not necessarily going to always have the uh, responsibility to play those more progressive passes. Whereas I think if you're looking it into a Liverpool side, if he's playing, for example, as a left side of six alongside Trent and Alexander-Arnold, then possibly the same thing is true. You're only going to need him to do the more regimented fight. But even within that, a, a, a great pass doesn't necessarily have to be one where he's hitting it 50 yards between three people. A great pass can be one where he's hitting it 10 yards between two people and he's hitting it in such a way that the person receiving the ball doesn't have to think about what he's going to do with it. He already knows. And it progresses the move that way. And those kind of passes, those kind of like, like you say, a tempo controller, that's what he looks like. And yeah. that's what I think this team is going to need alongside some of the other attributes that we've got. Yeah, con- controller is is how I would define him. He, he looks like an absolute signature controller to me uh, based on, you know, looking at the fact that he never loses the ball. And in terms of his touches, he averages more touches per 90 than any midfielder in Brazil at the minute. So he obviously gets on the ball a lot. Fluminense do dominate the ball in Brazil. Um, I think they have the most possession in their domestic league. But Andre is the guy who's who's doing the large majority of that. Um I kind of looked at his 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 switches of play as another example as to why he's he's not particularly like elaborate on the ball. Um so he averages about 0.5 switches per 90, which is about one switch every two games. Um over the course of it's, sorry, since his debut, since his debut in Brazil, he's hit a total of about 38 switches in about 6,500 minutes of action. Um, for perspective, last season, Trent hit 59 uh, in, that, in one season alone. Declan Rice hit 60. 
Um, so I, I think Andre looks like a real a real controller for me, a player who, as I said, reminds me of Arthur, but I think he's better without the ball than Arthur is. I think he's more intense without the ball than Arthur is. That was one of Arthur's big problems. What, what Arthur was just, I mean, we didn't get to see it because he only played 14 minutes. But if we, if we did see it, um, he was a controller who didn't really like to run. <laughs> mm. um, whereas I think Andre is a bit of a nice balance with that. He, he, he can put a foot in, he can be a bit of a dog if he, if he has to be. But predominantly, he's he's that control and presence based on the looks of it. Yeah, I think um, some of the word is that maybe he can be a little bit too aggressive in some of those ball winning tactics, which you'd obviously have to temper if he came over here. But he's still 22. So, and it's only really his second full season. So he's still got time to learn and develop those things. I think he's a really exciting talent. I think the idea of getting him in the building while Thiago is still around to maybe help develop and improve on his game, I think is a really, really enticing prospect. But, I mean, even aside from all of the actual tactical aspects of him as a player, the fact that we are going direct to the source, as it were, as opposed to buying him after he'd spent a year at Fulham or a Wolves who were also interested in him previously, is fascinating. What is yeah. determining this change? What has is it is it finances? Are we looking at trying to get a player cheaper so we can spend more money on some of the other talents? Or is it simply just a, a more of a trusting of the league out there to know that they don't necessarily need a bedding in period in the in Europe before we go for them? Fascinated by that part. Yeah, that is interesting, and that's that's part of the reason why I I just completely have not looked at him <laughs> because I didn't think he would end up on my radar. I thought he'd come to Europe first, which is just what usually happens. Um, so that's kind of how we slipped under the net a little bit. But it is interesting because you know we we've touched on. I mean, for me, he's not really a number six anyway. But no. we I have we we have touched on kind of how limited the market is for those kind of players a little bit. And I, I do wonder if this is just a case of Liverpool looking at the options available yeah, and almost just kind of being a bit like, we don't really like any of them. Uh, and, and then as a result of that, you look a little bit further afield and you, you get to South America and things like that. And um, I mean, there's a lad playing for Boca. I, th- I think, think he's still playing for Boca called Alan Varela, who's, um, I think he is a bit more of a, destructive type yeah but he looks to be on the verge of i think it's benfica that he's signing for for only about 10 million euros or something like that um but it's interesting so that we'll be talking going... about him next year then <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting that we're talking that, that that we're getting linked with andre instead who is as i said more of a controller than a destroyer liverpool just seem to be building the most offensive squad ever and like just not considering anything towards like what happens when the ball is lost you know what i mean yeah, it's, it's, it's strange because sometimes you think about the priorities of a transfer window and when you need to do lots of things, the things that you think are more important in terms of the team necess- necessities should be the ones that are done first. But sometimes it's the nature of the deal itself that determines which one goes first, whether it be price, whether it be ease of getting a player, negotiating with the selling club, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. At the moment, it feels like we're kind of caught between both those stools and it's, therefore we're kind of in stasis, which is not a good place to be at this stage of the season. So obviously, I assume and expect that those conversations are still going on behind closed doors, but it might be that there is still, especially now that their number one position, number one target in defence has come off the board, there may still be some discussions about how many players as opposed to just which players we bring in over the course of this window. Yeah, well, I think it could just be a case of, like, Klopp. Base. I think initially, if you look at, like, last season, season before and that, I think Klopp has had a real, a real like, variety of midfield options at his disposal. Now, a lot of them got injured too often, uh, and a lot of them got to a point where they were kind of over the hill. But if you look at, like, profiles, he kind of had really did have a mixed bag in yeah. terms of, like, there's your controller, there's your kind of dribbler, there's your progressive runner, you know, your third man kind of player, there's your destroyer and all that stuff. And I think, obviously, if we're losing Thiago next summer, there's your controller kind of replaced. 
Um, we haven't got a replacement for Fabinho yet, but maybe Lavi is kind of like a Henderson alternative, and Sobberfly and 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 um, McAllister could maybe be like a an Ox replacement and an Abbey replacement or something like that. Um, so maybe maybe that's where it's coming from, but. It is interesting to see I was linked with this player because, as I said, he's a, he, he's not a Fabinho replacement for me, um, no, no. and he's from South America. <laughs> uh, so it, it is interesting, and I, I do think this is probably one. Just as a guess, I think this is probably one that's going to happen in January if it does, that's simply true. because Fluminense, you know, they're currently in the middle of a season now, so that they want to, they obviously want to keep one of their best players. Um, but that would mean we go from now to January. Probably with our current options plus Romeo Lavia, which would be a bit of a risk, but I suppose yeah. it's, it's only six months at the same time, so it's it's a risk. It is. It's, it's undoubtedly a risk, and one that I mean, maybe they are looking for more because obviously this is the thing. Andre, as I say, if you're looking at profile, I still think that he, in the squad we've got at the moment, he is closest to Thiago, as you said. So the idea of signing a replacement for Thiago before we sign a replacement for any of the five midfielders who actually have left, it's kind of hilarious. <laughs> but is, yeah. at the same time, it's like, it makes me think that they are still trying to do more than just Lavia now and have him for later. Like, so three additions over the next 12 months as, as opposed to just those two. That still makes sense to me because if you look at it, matching up, Minutes, even if you're saying McAllister and Zobersly are going to be just as reliable and just as durable for us as they have been for their previous clubs, if you're going to say that um, Curtis Jones is going to increase his output from, I think he only played like under 1500 minutes last season, so he's probably going to increase that dramatically. Just with Fab and Hendo alone, it was six thousand over 6,000 minutes of football last season they played, a lot yeah. of it together. So yeah. It is a case of even in the best case scenario. Obviously, I've mentioned I've not mentioned Stefan Bicetic. He's in the Curtis Jones category of maybe matching or at least a matching at least or increasing his minutes. You are it's still an imperfect solution. And um, Joel Rabinowitz wrote a really good piece a couple of days ago talking about Liverpool leaving themselves short. And this would be the third summer in a row that that's happened if it was. If you think go back two summers ago, sorry, no, three summers ago, when um, Lovren left and we didn't replace him, and then obviously the centre back injuries happened and it was all crazy. Then obviously Genie did Genie left. He wasn't replaced until a little bit after with Thiago, but then obviously we replaced him with a guy who was never on the pitch. And then obviously last summer, where we were holding out for our dream midfielders, didn't really get anyone instead, and you know we saw what happened. So. I'd like to think that Liverpool will have learned from some of those errors, but it doesn't really seem like it. Maybe it seems like that it's not so much that they see them as errors. It's just they see them as that's their way. That's their way of doing things. We want to make sure that we've got the right person and we're going to do all of our due diligence. And if it means missing out, it means we're going to, we're more comfortable finding solutions from within, which is all well and good, but, takes away your margin for error. And we've seen, even though we've got most of the injured or injury prone guys out of the building, we ha- that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be scot-free. Like, we need to have a little bit more wriggle room in terms of if bad things happen. Because, guys, I hate to tell you, bad things are probably going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose one of the ways in which you can kind of address that is by... Not necessarily, you don't necessarily have to get in bodies, but as long as you get in players who who were available a lot more often than the lads we had. Um, Sobo Slide doesn't miss games, McAllister doesn't miss games, and again, if we're touching on Andre, he, he looks the same. Um, so far this season, I think Fluminense have played 16, 17, 18 to one of them, and he's played 14, he started 14 last season. He started 34 out of a possible 38, I think it was. Played over 3,000 minutes in the league alone. So he looks like a player who's going to be available a lot. Mm-hmm. Lavia is still only a kid. And last season, he, I think he started 24 Premier League games, but 
as far as I'm aware, at least so far, I don't think he has any injury concerns attached to his profile or anything like that. So I think I, I would I wouldn't how many how many lads have we lost? We've lost a fair few, you know. Five. <laughs> I think be, five, yeah. Five, all midfield is unbelievable. That yeah, yeah. month summer, mate, to lose Henderson, Fabinho, Naby, Milner, and Ox all in the same summer. It's it's bad management, mate. We whisper it, but it's bad management. Um, I know, and and again, it's in some ways you're correcting mistakes of the past for some of the guys who should have gone earlier. And again, you can say that to a certain extent they haven't planned for it in the way that Henderson and Fabinho's departures have kind of been sprung on us. But the fact is, is that we still it's still part, well, largely are doing that we're in the situation where five guys can leave in one summer. So you have to kind of take that on board. And as I said, learn the lessons. And at the moment, it's hard to say that we are doing that because I understand it slightly from Klopp's perspective in that you've got guys like Thiago and Bicetic who aren't going to be fit for the start of the season, but will be fit maybe a month into the season. So he's thinking, well, obviously my squad's going to look much different between now and September the 1st anyway. And he's still, I believe, reluctant to go with a big, big squad. The kind of squad that I, as I said, would um, would kind of give you that regular room for bad things going wrong. I still think that Klopp's kind of reluctant to do that. So it remains to be seen. But I think the stuff with Lavia at the moment where we're kind of, you know, tripping over ourselves, trying to squeeze a little bit extra out of it. Does, it's a little bit unseemly because, as we said, the time pressure. But without knowing the reasons behind it, it's hard to kind of be hypercritical or as critical as I sometimes want to be. Yeah, that is a strange one, to be fair. I mean, I think we've made two bids so far and they've both been rejected pretty quickly and we're probably just going to end up paying the full amount, I assume. Um, and as a result of that, getting them in later than we could have initially got them in. So it's again, it's it is slightly slightly weird, like, um. But yeah, if, I mean, if we if we round up on Andre, as I said, he's he's kind of like a very much a console on presence. Never really ever leaves the final uh, the middle third, based on what I've seen. Very much a middle no. third player for that reason. Maybe he could be a bit of a holding sitter uh, a little bit. But my my only concern with that is again, I don't think Liverpool have any real destructive type in the team. And I think if you look at the 11 that Klopp would pick, for example, the only the, the only players in, in Klopp's first choice 11, if, if Andre was to join, and he, to be honest, even if Lavia was to join, really, when you think about it, the only two lads who actually want to defend would be Van Dijk and Canati. I think everyone else just wants to go and bomb on and create and be expressive and, you know, play with the ball and that. And that that's at, at, at the minute, I think that's my biggest concern regarding Liverpool, just the, the kind of lack of balance. And, uh, you know, you've got like a bit of a scale here. It feels like we're really top heavy at the minute. Yeah. Um, I saw someone actually compare. I thought it was a good shout. It, it kind of depicts shades of, of 2017, really, when you think about it. At that point, we had like Firmino, Coutinho at the time, Salah, Mane. And at the back, you've got like Radnar Clavan, Simon Mignolet. And I think Moreno, yeah. And I think now we've got better individuals at the back, no doubt. But in terms of just the team being a little bit too, let's go and score goals. Yeah. I think that that could potentially sting us if we don't get that sorted before the the season starts. Um, And I suppose one of the the talking points that ties into that a little bit when we want to kind of like pre-season stuff is what happened against Bayern Munich really and um, I think one of the talking points that come out of it was, was Andy Robertson hmm. because he is supposed to be, in this system at least, when Liverpool have the ball, he's supposed to be a left-sided wide centre-back. That's what he's supposed to be, at least if you look at how City do it and how Arsenal do it. But from the, for the most part, what I've seen is he is 50% a wide centre-back, if that and still 50% that kind of high-flying, attack-minded fullback who advances and overlaps and crosses and creates in the final third. And the, one of the reasons 
why that's been a bit of an issue for me is is when Liverpool lose the ball and, and we get done on the break, um, Van Dijk and Canate are covering massive spaces and a lot of it stems from you've got two at the back rather than three. Yeah, and I, I kind of have sympathy because I can understand how we got to this situation. Because if you think about it, Andy Robertson, he will believe that he has the discipline to be able to do that role. He will believe that he won't want to give up the shirt. And Klopp will want to believe that he has it as well. So when it was first mooted, it was like, no, I'll be able to do it. I'll be disciplined enough. I'll rein myself in. But then I don't know whether or not Klopp thought this or, or whether Andy Robertson thought this. But if you look about Liverpool at their best, at their peak, they had two fullbacks, high and wide, flying. And in this new system, they would have zero fullbacks, high and wide, flying, because Robertson would be, like you say, a third centre-back with discipline, and Trent is inverted into midfield. So that doesn't matter so much if you've got wingers or wide players who are going to hug the touchline. But one of our wide players is Mo Salah, who gets in the box a lot. And the other one is Luis Diaz, who has a propensity to cut inside rather than hug the outside. So suddenly you've got a width problem. So yeah. I can understand why Klopp was like, we can kind of have our cake and eat it here and maybe do both. Yeah. And I think, personally, the issue is kind of leaving it up to Robbo when to go and when to stay. Because from yeah. what I understand from what Klopp said, that is the situation. It's up to him to read the game. And again, if you're with Robbo and you're in a situation where you see a bit of space in front of you, you know Luis Diaz has kind of drifted inside. You're thinking, maybe I should go out there. Or maybe I can go out there and cause some trouble. And his natural instincts will take over. And if you look at that Bayern Munich game, the goal that we scored in the first three minutes was Robertson out wide playing a one-two with Gakpo and releasing him into the goal. So from an attacking perspective, he can, you can see the benefits, but you're right. We can't have everybody doing their attacking bits. We need some people who, for whom defence is the first instinct. We need, sorry, sorry, we need more people for whom defence is the first instinct. So whether or not Klopp and Linders are going to have to sit down Robertson and say, okay, here are your triggers to go forward and nothing else or whether or not they're going to have to get in another player who does have that as his instinct to interchange between Robertson. Because I do think that against the right opponents, that really is a positive. And I can understand why Klopp doesn't want to take away all of the greatness that Robertson has shown in that role over the years. But you can't do it against everyone. <laughs> yeah, I agree with everything that you've just said. Literally everything. Um I tweeted yesterday a little quote from Klopp that he said shortly after kind of using this box system for the first time. And he said, he was asked about Robertson and he said, of course, his role has changed slightly. That's clear. We cannot have one fullback in the centre of the field and the other constantly high up on the left side. That's what he said. And anyone with a brain tactically would know that you can't really play like that. Um, but... I don't know if it's positive results, you know, decent performances. We haven't, I mean, I think, I think Bayern Munich was our first loss with this system and it was still only a friendly. Um, maybe that's influenced a little bit, but it, do, it does feel a little bit like Robertson started this with a bit, a bit more of a harness on him. And it feels like uh, over time, maybe that harness has loosened a little bit. Yeah, And I do think a lot of it is just, as you say, I think a lot of it's down to Klopp saying to him, you be the judge, you're an experienced player. And I can I can understand why he's doing that, really. But I, I completely agree with the with the width problem as well. But I think if it was me, I would sacrifice the width and, and to have that extra body at the back mm -hmm. just so that you've got more balance and to almost keep supporters quiet. Because yeah. I think... I think Klopp doing this, it's it's hurting them in the sense that it, it's making us look like we desperately need a left-sided centre-back and it's increasing and fueling that chat. Whereas in reality, in my opinion, we just need our left-sided centre-back to stay. He just needs to stay, at yeah. least. You know, if he stayed, it would look a lot better, trust me. But 
I, 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 I agree. I think he can, I, I do think he can do the job. It's funny because when we first started doing it, I was skeptical because it's so out of step with how everyone else does it. But then you think about Liverpool and you think that maybe that that can be the strength, that we aren't doing it the way everyone else is doing it. So when other teams start game planning against it, the game plans that maybe works against an Arsenal, a Brighton, a Man City doesn't necessarily work as well against us because we're doing it differently. So I get that part of it. But then again, it's, it's, it's horses for courses. So there's going to come a time where a team is going to come to Anfield and they're going to try and pack the middle of the field. They know that we're probably going to have uh, McAllister, Zobersly, maybe even Trent in and around the central areas. If Gakpo's playing, he might be dropping off and coming into those areas as well. So they're just going to pack the middle of the field, make it really hard for us. And we've seen it many times over the last few seasons where we haven't been at our best. The whole the width of the penalty area has got nearly 20 players in it. And we're trying to play wonder, wonder passes, one touch passes to get in. In those scenarios... Robertson will see loads of space in front of him. <laughs> then you can say, okay, maybe you can utilize some of that space, but we still need to have a plan to cover. So if in that sense, if that is the case, then you say to one of those central guys, okay, you need to drop back 20 yards to make sure if there's a counter attack, you can get into position. So there's times when you can utilize it, but like I say, you just got to be smarter about when and against whom. Yeah. I also think it's, it just makes less sense him doing this overlapping at the minute when our number six is Curtis Jones right now. So in terms of if the ball is lost, we, we just have less of a safety net. We don't have that fire extinguisher in the team. It's Curtis Jones who's doing his best. It's not his fault, but he's not that. He's not a specialist in that sense. So just again, considering, I know we're only playing friendlies, by the way, but just considering that, just Robertson, just stay back for now. And, yeah. and, if, and if you look at the forwards we've got as well, like you talk, if you mentioned the width being like an offensive problem, I think it would be an offensive problem in certain games or whatever. But if you look at the forwards we've got and the creation that we've got on that team as well, mm. you'd like to think that if Robertson didn't bomb on as much, we'd still find openings and we'd still find a net enough to, to get positive results and things like that. So, yeah, I just think right now it just it's it's not helping anybody the, the no, amount of right. what happened he's doing i think in the in the situation we're in i think you have to be smarter and hopefully that would have been the chat in the dressing room or maybe on the training ground the day after the game because again when we think about this new system apart from the second half against arsenal where it was born we haven't really played that many good teams against it so there was still not as much data on that so maybe you can understand why they're still kind of working it out, thinking, well, maybe we can get away with this, but no, we couldn't. But to be honest, like that was all a fascinating part of it, the, the buying game. But I only watched the highlights, I have to confess, go Jamaica. But you look at the goals that we conceded and they were all very much in the Joel Matip slash Ibu Kanate area. And obviously the fourth goal is a little bit of an anomaly because he smashed it in from the end. Like, he's literally taken one bounce over the top and he smashed it. But if we are going to be playing the system and we are going to be playing it at a time when we're maybe rotating players, we're still at the point where not enough... The system doesn't suit enough of us. So, like I said, it suits certain opponents in certain situations. It does suit certain players in the squad much more than others, which, again shortens your options when it comes to rotation. Because, like, I don't want to go full scale on Joe Matip because the thing about preseason games is we don't know what else they've been doing on that day. So they could have had a tra another training session previously. So he may not necessarily be in the peak physical condition you'd expect him to be on match day. But if you look at that game and you think about the wide open spaces that he has to cover, the pace that he no longer does have, and you just think that any manager worth his salt is just going to be like, play over there, play over there, <laughs> play over there. Yeah. And we can't do that. So are we going to have to accelerate our transfer policy or are we going to have to say, look, we have to mix and match with the systems? And I think the latter is really what we're going to have to do. We haven't seen much evidence of that, but maybe 
the reason we're seeing this box system so much is because it's the new one. So they need to get the reps up with that. And maybe behind closed doors, they are still playing the other system, the more traditional 4 3 3, which would allow someone like Matip a little bit more protection. So he's not got to cover quite so much of the pitch. But it is worrying because, again, it just means that, okay, we've got a little bit more to do. And I look at some of the other teams, I think particularly the teams who we are really fighting with, and that's Manchester United, Arsenal, Newcastle. New- Arsenal are definitely more of a solid team right now than we are. They've got every area covered in a better way than we have. Manchester United, that's still an argument for debate, but they're getting there. Newcastle, they'd probably say the same. I'm not quite as convinced. But we're in a situation where these are the teams we're fighting with. So it's all well and good thinking that we um, we can kind of get around this and we can get around that. Like I keep saying, we don't have a large margin for error at the moment. We need to build up some of that. Yeah, see, I, I, have, I have big thoughts on this really because I, I think um, a lot of people are blaming the system and um, suggesting that it's... It's the system's fault. We need to bend the system. We need to go back to 4 3 3 and the players and the and all that stuff, right? But I think for me, I just I want Liverpool to play the actual system. That that's my concern. We're not playing it, but we aren't playing the actual 3 2 5 because Robertson is doing so much offensive work, um, leaving his his defensive partners exposed a lot of the time. Um Salah and Diaz or whoever's playing on the left are not specifically holding the width as much as they really yeah. should do. Um we're still kind of playing at times with a nine who's a bit more of a false nine than a, a lad who, who threatens him behind. Um and it's in terms of like the profiles not fitting this not, not fitting the system. I do agree to an extent, but I, again I think you can tamper that. You can you can put a harness on that if you just use tactical instructions for, with the player. Like say for example me. When I play football, right, I am an, att- <laughs> I am an attack-minded player. That That's what I'm like as a player, right? But if you was to play me as a left-back who becomes a wide centre-back when we've got possession and you told me before the game, stay, I would yeah. stay, even yeah. though I'm a t- an attack-minded kid. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I, my frustration is not is that the way in which we're executing this system is making it look bad, I think. I think we can execute the system a lot better and a lot more effectively. Maybe sacrifice a bit in attack to get a bit more in defence. Um, and then we can make judgments. Because I, I think, say, for example, I, I tweeted yesterday the buying game. Obviously, we conceded four. Um, I tweeted after the game. I, I think Liverpool would have still conceded four with, with Lavia on the pitch. I don't think it was one of them games where Liverpool conceded four because they don't have a defensive uh, midfielder. For me, it was a a bit more of a systemic uh, yeah. collapse uh, during the game. I would say you can possibly say the Sané goal because there's a break on and... The Curtis, second one? Yeah, yeah, Curtis yeah. tries yeah. to get into position and he doesn't yeah. quite manage it. That's the only time where if you've got a presence in that area of the pitch, it's a bit more difficult. But you're right, I and again, I think it's a lot of the time the system, however we play it, would leave the um, the player who's playing where Matip is with a lot of ground to cover and potentially a fast guy to run and chase after, which again brings you back to, okay, well, that player is not necessarily the best to deal with that scenario. So then you do do you build in extra fail safes. And I mean, he, do, he wasn't great a lot of last season, but that was one thing to say about Henderson was is that he had that mindset of knowing when he had to drop back and be part of the defensive structure. I and mean, again, we, maybe we just need more players who've got that in mind. I think you're right, though, in terms of <clears throat> playing the system better. I do think that that is key, and I think that that will come. We have to remember we are still very much in its infancy, doing it. But then, if you think about it, the system itself is kind of in its infancy because, I mean, even if you think back to, what, City, Brighton were probably the first to do it. It's only really been a couple of years. And the thing I worry about is that if we go all in with this, what happens when someone cracks it? <laughs> and suddenly, if we've bought specifically for this and only this, yeah, 
then what happens when we've got a lot of players who you suddenly have to bring them all to a whole new system and they're all a bit like, mm, maybe not, maybe. So, again, you, 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 could, you can probably work yourself into a stupor thinking about all these things and I dare say some of our coaches probably do. Yeah, and I, I, to be honest as well, I, another thing that I want to add, and this is, I suppose, where the the perspective kind of comes in now. We did face Bayern Munich. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? the, the champions of Germany, right, who are among the very best in the world when it comes to punishing your transition. So I think it was, in that sense, a good kind of test to learn where you're at and where your weaknesses are. Because yeah. I think... One of the issues with this system, obviously, is it you form a different shape without the ball than you do with the ball. So, obviously, in order to get into that position where you form your attacking shape, for that to happen, you have to control possession and everything has to be secure. And then everyone does the little subtle movements then. Against Bayern Munich, who are a high-pressing, very good team, it's really difficult to, to control Bayern Munich for, for 90 minutes. Um, so... A lot of the time, you know, we were a little bit caught between two posts. Um, and if you are caught between two posts and you lose the ball against Bayern Munich, they've got Leroy Sane and Serge Gnabry on the break. who are just, they're going to kill you. So, yeah. you know, e- even Chelsea, to be honest, are, are not that dangerous when it comes to um, getting punished for not executing this system the way it should be executed. Bayern Munich are a, a real exception when it comes to this sort of stuff. So it's obviously, it's kind of, I suppose it's kind of highlighted, it's emphasised um, Liverpool's vulnerability. I don't think we are as vulnerable as we looked because it's Bayern Munich. You know, we're not going to face them every week. No. But then I do think that Pochettino will be smart enough to have watched that game and to be able to use yeah. that to inform how he goes about it because... We can obviously work on it and use that game as footage to kind of see what went wrong and, and develop. But whether or not we'll be able to do it this quickly, I don't know. I do think <clears throat> it might even inform his selection. So if you think about the kind of skills that Bayern Munich could got, and you mentioned the two flyers out wide, maybe that means he starts with a Madrid and Sterling and then Nkunku's playing behind a striker rather than having Nkunku out wide or maybe even a non Madueke. So I do think that the Chelsea game will be a very strong test for this system. But I do, I mean, I, again, I think we'll have enough time between now and then to get some reps in to look better at it. And hopefully we'll have enough to deal with it. But personally, my gut feeling as we sit here right now is that we're going to have a season where we're winning a lot of games 4-3 and we're drawing a lot of games 2-2 after being 2-0 up. And we're probably not quite getting the results that some of our play in those games deserves. But then next season will be better. At the moment, that's my gut feeling. Yeah, I wouldn't overly disagree, to be honest. Uh, I think Chelsea played last night in Borussia Dortmund and Pochettino picked a team that is close to what he's going to pick for Liverpool. And he actually said that after the game in terms of getting those specific players up to full fitness. And they had kind of, it was four, two, three, one. And in the in, in the attack, it was Raheem Stalin on one flank and Konku on the other flank. Nicholas Jackson up front. Uh, and Chukwameka as the number ten. Yeah. Um and obviously you've got Conor Gallagher as part of the midfield too as well, who likes to ally likes to arrive late. We know that so Obviously, Chelsea have definitely got threats. That you know, definitely got speed. Um, but I, I'm specifically talking in reference to Bayern Munich. You, yeah, you, you're going to be unlucky if you're facing a team as good as Bayern Munich in transition every week. Um, yeah, and, and the ironic thing as well is that Bayern Munich, who at one point had what I thought was one of the most devastating double pivots in world football, have broken it up because it's no yeah. longer Kimmich and Goretzka. It's now Kimmich and Conrad Leimer who is a little bit more defensively minded. So they know that they've got so much great attack and time at the top end of the pitch. They thought that maybe they need to reinforce their defensive styles. Imagine that. <laughs> By the way, this is exactly why Bayern Munich wants Harry Kane. Um, you've got Serge Gnabry on one flank, Lilo Shane on the other, potentially Kingsley Coman on one, on one of them. And we know Harry Kane likes to drop into the middle and he's extremely good at finding his wide players who are going to be on them. So you can quite clearly see what Thomas Tuchel's trying to do there. 
Um, but yeah, I agree in terms of like Liverpool as it stands, uh, just look a little bit top heavy, as I keep saying it. Um, and I, I do think we need reinforcements. Obviously, we need like a. I do think we need a whole midfielder. I do think we ideally need a left footed centre half, and uh, and that sort of stuff. But I do think that even despite needing those players, some of this can be tackled tactically by just kind of someone putting a leash on Klopp, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> I think he's a little bit nuts when it comes to like goals and attack-minded football, and that's why we love him, you know. But sometimes, and I think this is one of them, you need a little bit, you, you need a bit of a Rafa Benitez in the room, who's kind yeah. of, a, you know, just a bit like, listen, where's the balance here? I mean, and he, he will know that, by the way. I mean, Stephen Klopp, but I'm just, I'm yeah. coming at it from a, uh, you know. And to be honest, I kind of get it, but <clears throat> he's looking at last season. And we're kind of thinking, it's funny because most of the narrative around our strikers of the season was of the chances that they missed. But I think if you look at last season, it, the most noticeable thing about our attack was that we weren't creating as many chances in open play as we do normally. And maybe that was one of his main focuses coming into this is like, we need to get better at that. I think mission accomplished on that score, by the way, because from looking at these um, preseason games, our attack not only looks more, it looks sharper, but they look more fluid. They look more connected and look a lot more dangerous. So I feel like we're going to go into the season feeling like we'll go into every single game confident that we can score at least one goal, maybe two, which is a great feeling to have. But the problem is, is that if we get into a game feeling like we have to score two at least to get a win and that's just exhausting. You're not going to be able to do that all season long. It's just not. Yeah. I mean, as I said, it goes back to like that 2017 vibe. Um, really entertaining season and, and, you know, lots of ups and downs and some some 6 nil wins and some 4 nil defeats, basically, is, that, is is how it's looking at the minute. Yeah. Um, but, I, you I mean, know, I've got to throw in there. That? How did we fix that? We signed Fabinho. <laughs> 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 literally, Fabinho's gone. And it's like, oh, no, we can go back to that now. <laughs> I know it's crazy, isn't it? I think it's it's just it's it's only pre season. That's what we need to stress, by the way. You know, Klopp has has stressed that like it's about players not getting injured essentially at this stage. So first game of the season against Chelsea at Stamford Bridge, we could see a complete new approach to how this system is executed on the pitch. You know, Robertson could stay back a lot more. Diaz could hold the width with Salah. Um, you know, we just don't know, but. Based on what we're seeing so far, and based on how the squad shaping up and looking at the market and things like that, it it just looks very attacking, uh, which is better than being very defensive, I suppose. You know, it, it, I think it's easier to fix a defence than it is to fix an attack. Uh, and if you look at Chelsea, for example, Chelsea's attack has been a massive problem for them for seasons now. Yeah. Liverpool have the attack sorted. It, it, we just need to become a bit more balanced, I think. Um. But yeah, I mean, should we? I think we should round up then, because we've, we've kind of spent a lot of time there on here, on preseason games and 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 Andre. We we did have one or two other talking points, but we can save them uh, for further down the line. Um, but yeah, Liverpool have got another friendly in the coming days, I think, and obviously the Premier League start is 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 relatively soon. But I think we've got another week in between now. But we'll keep building up to it anyway. So Mo, thanks for joining us, mate. No problem. And the reason why I think we took so long on those conversations is we always like to take it to its conclusion. We like to give everything space yeah. to breathe, every topic space to breathe. So sometimes we only go through two or three topics, but we go through those topics. Yeah, it's a good point. Like it, it, it's very easy to come out, come at each topic from one perspective and just thinking like we need midfielders, you know, we need a left side of the centre half. But obviously there's lots of different um, parties involved with this sort of thing. You've got the supporters, you've got the coaches, you've got the recruitment departments and all this. So, you know, it's just kind of trying to determine what they're thinking, essentially, and, and, and why we're doing what we're doing. But yeah. there's still a, almost a month left of the transfer window, so plenty of time to get that sort of thing sorted, even if it won't be for, for the first game against Chelsea. I will say, by the way, just a quick one, in terms of Lavia, even if we do sign Lavia, I still probably think it's Jones is starting as the six on the first day. Uh, yes. So that's a little bit irrelevant, to be honest. But yeah, we'll we'll round up there. So Mo, thanks for joining us, mate. And no uh, 
we will see you next week. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to the Analyzing Anfield podcast on the Blood Red channel.